Welcome. We are so glad that you've set aside a little time, especially in the busy month of September, to breathe in and breathe out the presence of the Holy Spirit. My name is Pastor Lauren Bruno, and I serve at St. John's Ridge Valley here in Sellersville, Pennsylvania. Each week, we take a little time out of our busy schedules to read scripture together, share a hymn or a song of praise, and ask God, where are you calling us this week? This week, I'm excited to dive into the book of 1 Samuel and hear the story of Hannah. We're listening particularly for the theme of God's work and our hands. So you can turn with me, if you'd like, to 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man of Ramathim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, a son of jo Jeroam, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Nana, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child. Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought that she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant your petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his household went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and remain there forever. I will offer him as a Nazarite for all time. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him, only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took him up along with her. 
along with a three-year-old bowl, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. She brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed that the Lord, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. She left him there for the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This might seem like a little bit of a strange story. Born out of a frustration and jealousy for her fellow wife to Elkanah, Hannah prays to God for a son. Barrenness in this time was seen as a curse, and Hannah's fellow wife, Penina, has, has visited upon her great mockery and insults because of her barrenness. This story has many elements of it that might be strange, triggering, or painful to us, from the story of Hannah's inability to conceive and how much pain that brought her, to the fact that Elkanah had two wives, and this was seen as totally okay in this day and time. It's not brought up in this part of the scriptures. It's common knowledge. This is a strange story, and we could spend a few hours on it, but I won't, don't worry. I want us to pay attention instead to the story of Hannah. Hannah in this story is filled with grief and makes her petition to God. She needs God's help. But the strangest part of this story might be, to us at least, that the son that Hannah prays for, she then turns around and gives to God as soon as he is weaned. She hands over her young child to Eli the priest and leaves him in the temple to be a servant of God. What benefit does Hannah have from having this child, then? Does this even count? Was this all just so that Hannah could say that she wasn't barren? I think something bigger is happening here than the jealousy and arguments and social expectations that we see in this story. You see, Hannah prays to God and trusts that in the fulfillment of this prayer, God will multiply the work of her hands. She had a son, but she knows that God can bless the world far more through this son than she can. And she is willing to take a leap of faith, to honor her vow, to trust that God will work through her hands and through Samuel's. Samuel will grow up, of course, to be a great prophet in the house of Israel, a servant to Eli the priest. He will overtake Eli in prominence and in God's words spoken through him. The world will not be the same after Hannah's prayer. And though the work that she did in bearing a son was great, and in the work of raising him and handing him over to God, God's work is even greater. It takes the work of Hannah's hands and multiplies them. Why do I say this now? In the ELCA, which is our denomination, we celebrate God's work, our hands, Sunday, this Sunday, September 11th this year. We take a moment out of the year to remember that our purpose as a church, our identity, is that we trust that God is going to do God's work through our hands. That our prayers might be multiplied in the work that God does through them. That our service to our neighbor, our feeding of the hungry, our walking with those who are struggling, our welcome to those who have been excluded in so many other places, over and over and over again, in whatever work we find ourselves called to, God will continually bless and multiply the work of our hands. 
And so we set aside this Sunday to do service projects intentionally, remembering that this is our identity. Not the beauty of our buildings, not how many people are seated in our pews, not the money in our coffers. Our identity can be found in the work that we do out of love for one another, trusting that God's love is being spoken through the work of our hands. God's work, it's our hands. So, this week we invite you to come back to church, to sit in the pews, to bring your backpacks for blessing if you're a student or a teacher, to mark the beginning of a new year this fall with a project. We're going to be putting together school bags for children all over the world through Lutheran World Relief this Sunday. We'll have just one worship service, and Dr. Crystal Hall is coming to preach for us at this 9.30 a.m. service. Directly after, we're going to have a continental breakfast together, and we're going to share in this service project. We'll have fun, we'll laugh, and we'll love and serve our neighbor. What could be better? You're invited, whether you join us online or in person. Now, today, we remember God's work, our hands, Sunday, but it doesn't just happen one day out of the year. This is our identity and our commitment each and every day out of the year as disciples of Christ. And so it's with that in mind that we join in this hymn, which I don't think you would have heard before. It's called God's Work, Our Hands, and it was commissioned in 2019 as a new hymn for the ELCA. The words will appear on the screen as usual, and I hope that you'll join in. God's work our hands, working together, building a future, repairing the world, raising up homes, planting new gardens, feeding the hungry and sheltering the cold. Bless God our hands as we work in your name. Sharing the good news of your gospel. God's work our feet, traveling together, following Jesus to places unknown. Walking as friends, marching for freedom, running the race with God's future. into a new school year, a new program year, a new season. May God do God's work through your hands. Life is short, and we haven't much time to gladden the hearts of those with whom we walk this earth. 
So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace with Christ at your side. Thanks be to God, and amen.